Well, hello and welcome back to Noah's Window. Again, we're in the book of Romans, and now we're in chapter 3. We've been looking forward to chapter 3. Uh, and as you were saying before the camera started rolling, Paul's going to start out by kind of drawing a conclusion, doing a little cleanup work here. This is a really important section as Mary Alice reads. And, and I think you'll see modern applications as mm, well. So let's yeah. start in chapter 3, verse 1. Then, what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? Yes, there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. True, some of them were unfaithful. But just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? Of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say about him, you will be proved right in what you say, and you will win your case in court. But some might say, our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. Of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? But someone might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? And some people even slander us by claiming that we say, the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. Well, you saw the two pushbacks. The first one would be from Paul's Jewish audience there in Rome. Because in chapter 1, remember, he said the secular sinner is guilty before God. And there's that long list of well, what we might call blue-collar sins. Then he goes into chapter 2, and he's writing to the religious group, which in those in that scenario was been primarily Jewish. And he's basically saying that the, the religious person is just as guilty before God because A, they do the same things, and then B, they they don't recognize that God's mercy is their opportunity to turn from sin, and they need a Savior too. So he understood that his Jewish audience, having been told through the centuries that their relationship with God was based on their nationality and the covenant relationship that they were in, he knew that some of them would say, well, then what you're saying is there's no benefit in being a Jew. And, and, and they preempted Paul's answer by saying, well, maybe what you're saying is, is because the Jewish people turned away from God and that we had the captivity and all those things, and perhaps God's no longer in a covenant relationship with, with them. And Paul is saying, no, that's not true. God is still in a covenant relationship with Israel, and there are benefits to being Jewish because we, you know, the Jewish people received what we would call the word of God. It was, it, was given, it was given to the Jewish people, through the Jewish people, to the rest of the world. And he said there are many benefits. He didn't articulate what some of the others were. But I do want to take a moment and just talk about something, Mary Alice, before we go on to the next, that straw man pushback. Um, there are a lot of teachers today who want to say that God is no longer in a covenant relationship right. with Israel. We've watched the popularization of Reformed theology, and for some reason it's just really it's really encroached on the evangelical church and not only and I've, I've told this this many times I know but not only have they bought into the reformer soteriology the idea that God picks some for salvation and, and rejects others and basically they had no opportunity to be saved you know God decides who's going to hell who's going to heaven ahead of time well I, I mean that's ridiculous and there are so many scriptures that talk about human responsibility in that era area and really they make God responsible for wrong but but that's just the the salvation soteriology side of it there's an eschatology side to the reformation to the reformers a number of them were anti-semitic and because God had all these promises to Israel about the last days and the millennial reign which are all over the Old Testament my goodness every time we read in the mornings we run across yes. those so God is like there's going to be this great reign where God's going to turn everything around and restore Jerusalem well, that was inconvenient for them. And they just started teaching, well, the church has replaced Israel. So consequently, all those promises that God made in the millennial reign, the millennial kingdom, um, <laughs> that's to the church. They spiritualized all of these texts. And the term spiritualized, is, it, it just basically means changing the meaning from from a literal meaning to some kind of foggy meaning. And again, I think I talked about this the other day, and I'm sorry for repeating myself, but you know, the starting with Augustine, th there was this belief that the church had replaced Israel, and consequently this there was going to be a thousand year reign. The Bible's real clear on that in Revelation, but the problem was after a thousand years had passed, and we started going into the later centuries, well then the idea came to be, well, we're, we're too, you know, we can't be in the millennium, because it's it, it's gone past a thousand years and there were those who said well maybe a thousand is not a literal term you know maybe it's just mm -hmm. kind of a, 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 a 
maybe it's just something that God pulled out of the air to say it's going to be a long time. But a lot of them just said, well, there is no millennium. And that's how we get off millennialism. Prefix A means no. And so Paul is debunking that. And he is basically saying, no, God is still in a covenant relationship with Israel. And we need to hear that today because yes. there are a lot of people out there that claim to be Bible-believing evangelicals who see modern day Israel as having nothing to do with the Israel of the Word of God. And the second question is a straw man question. And he understands that there are going to be people that are going to push back against grace, which we still have with us today. And so here's what they're going to try to do. They're going to try to say, this is absurd. And, and so I don't think, I, I'm not saying here that, that Paul's enemies actually believed what they accused him of. They're accusing Paul of this and saying, consequently, we don't have to listen to the rest of what you have to say about justification by faith because what you're saying is absurd. And here is the argument, the straw man that they raise. They say, well, if what you're saying is true, then really, it, we, we really need to just not worry about sinning because our sinning displays the righteousness of God. And he goes on to say that some say, and this is in verse 8, people even slander us by claiming that we say the more we sin the better it is and those which say those things paul said are to be condemned which is pretty strong strong language but clearly that's not what grace is and anyone who truly understands grace knows it's not typically it's somebody who's trying to make the argument for works for salvation and they'll try to uh, create an absurd straw man situation which sounds so ridiculous that people will shake their heads and say, well, no, that's not true. And I would argue that that same slandering goes on even today. Oh my goodness, and, and, more than ever. Okay, so I'm gonna throw this out at you and see what you, what you might say to this because we see so much of these uh, reformed theology and, and they say it with pride, I'm, I'm reformed. But it sounds to me like they have almost odd idolized the reformers in, uh, in, in embracing their teaching, which was, you know, centuries ago, uh, to, to the uh, contradiction of the scripture, which reminds me of a story we, we had a seminary professor tell us years ago um, who, who had uh, students who, were, who believed this stuff. And, um, and when he very graciously presented what the scripture said, this young seminarian slammed his Bible on the desk and said, I don't care what the Bible says. And I would argue that today, those that are uh, preaching and teaching this theology are doing it in the face of what is clearly taught in the scripture. And I think that's just a real danger. And, and I, I just, that's another reason why I believe Everybody, and I know it's one of family, everybody can study the, the Bible for themselves. And you don't have to rely on, you don't have to pick a camp and then adopt whatever that camp leader says. Well, one of the reasons we talk about this is becoming so prolific. Yes, I mean, very much so. I get letters from people in Kansas and other places who will say, I'm in a church and we have a young pastor coming in and this is all he's talking about. Well, I want to make one thing clear, and I know I've made it clear in the past. For anyone who may even be watching this and come from a hyper-Calvinist background, it could be that someone's saying, well, Mark just doesn't know better. You need to understand, I was trained in a theology school that was highly hyper-Calvinist and very much Reformed theology. I had to read all the books, had to write all the papers, had to regurgitate all the answers. Had a very good systematic theology professor. He's a friend, but he was dead wrong. Thankfully, I had a background in debate and I know how evidence is manipulated, and I recognized it when I was reading all those books. You also had spent a lifetime immersed in the scripture because well, of true. your family. You had you you knew the scripture. Well, I mean, I, we didn't have a television when I was growing right. up, so I did a lot of reading uh, and, and I read a lot of scripture. But, you know, Jesus talked about this, and I know we, we spent a long time today, Mary Ellison, I probably need to wrap this up, but, you know, when Jesus was on the earth, the hearers of Jesus were intrigued by him because they said he speaks like one having authority and not from a lot like the other teachers who quoted each other, you know? And, well, the reason he had authority was he was the Word of God and he, and he spoke the Word of God. There is an authority to God's Word. And, and you know, for some reason, this Reformed theology really is attractive to um, the Ivy Tower, uh, academia, um, and, and frankly, um, to 
the less productive among us, and that's important. Because thing it absolves you of any responsibility. Sure. And mm -hmm. and um, you know, here's the deal: if I, if I get up to preach and I think some people are going to make a decision for Jesus today, or they're going to decide against Him, somebody who could go to heaven is could go to hell if they don't accept Christ. Ooh, that's going to change the whole way I look at the ministry. If I step up to preach and I think the people who are going to heaven are going to heaven, people are going to hell are going to hell. And the only reason I preach the decision to be made is for the glory of God. It doesn't, you know, no one here, no, no one's soul is in eternal jeopardy that God has not already ordained for salvation. Well, of course, it just, it, it, it really does grow a whole generation of losers in the, in the, in the pulpit. And, and that's what we really are dealing with in America today. It's sad. It's it sad to be under that deception. It's a satanic deception, I believe. It is. And having, like I said, having been immersed in the other side, and and by a professor I dearly loved, yes, and loved dearly. Actually, had him come up and do a seminar on teaching after I became pastor. Many here. years ago. Many, Many years, years ago. ago. I mean, I didn't let him talk about You're soteriology right. or eschatology, yeah. but he was a phenomenal teacher. Um, so I don't want you to think that I have an axe to grind or that I hate these people. I do not. I hate. I, th I hate what that teaching does to people. But I love, I, and, I, and I know many of them are very sincere and believe it, but I, it is great that Paul is talking to us here about knocking down straw men and saying just because somebody puts up some kind of absurd argument that, that mischaracterizes what the Bible is teaching doesn't mean they have to be listened to. And the greatest defense against that is to immerse ourselves in the, in the entirety of Scripture because anyone who's making those kind of arguments will cherry pick Scriptures and say, see, read this, 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 and this, and therefore this is my conclusion. Yeah, and, and I know Meryl's have gone way too long today, but let me go one more place because, you know, I get mail uh, every time I do a prophecy mm -hmm. series, you know, I'm reminded why a lot of churches don't want to do prophecy series because I'm going to get mail from all millennialists who say, how dare you preach on the rapture? The rapture's not in the Bible, which is like 17 feet on the other side of certifiably insane, but but having said that, I know that's out there, you know, mm -hmm. that, that idea is, is out there, and when when a lot of these people who have this idea, they're going to create an argument from absurdium uh, to put, a, you know, to speak against the rapture. And here's what they'll say: mm -hmm. They're like, "Oh, that's that's that left behind stuff." No, I mean, the left behind series is one thing. First of all, Tim LaHaye was a pretty smart guy and a great scholar. However, what they are with disregarding is two thousand years of Bible scholarship, mm -hmm. and and so, you know, it, it's a, it's an argument from absurdity, and it probably pulls away people that don't know better, which is really sad. But again, I want to go back to you. The, the best defense is knowing your Bible. And uh, the professor you were talking about, because you described the scenario to me so many times, went from his high position and literally in that class it was elevated where he was. sat. <laughs> so he's kind of like intimidating in his position. And he made a declaration and said, can anyone tell me this? Well, Mark answered him. But the reason Mark was able to answer him is because he knew the scripture and he quoted back scripture. Yeah. And so your best defense against false teaching is to know the Bible for yourself. And that is what we're passionate about. It is true. Well, thank you for bearing with yes. us today. It turned out to be a longer notice. I'm trying to edit it down a little bit. Oh, I don't know. I think, I think this is pretty good. Uh, but I'm glad you joined us today. We're, yes. we're living in the last days and we need this wonderful book of Romans to just reset our thinking in key areas or bolster our thinking. Right. Get clarity. Get clarity. Get clarity. Yep. Pray for us, Mary Alice. Yes, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us the privilege of holding your word in our hand that we can read and study for ourselves. And I just pray for each of us, Father, everyone in our Noah's Window family, that you would uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit to give us understanding as we read, that we would grow to know you better and, and our relationship with you would grow stronger every day and that we would be strong against the false teachers of this day. I pray that you would just watch over us today. There, I know there are many in our Noah's Window family that have sickness or tragedy or uh, just grave concerns that they're dealing with today. And I just pray that you would be with them, wrap them in your love, draw them into your presence, comfort them as only you can and provide for them as we trust you will. And we'll be careful to give you the glory and the honor and the praise for all these things. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mary Alice. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow, a very special Friday again. Mm -hmm. And then this weekend at New Spring, I have the privilege of preaching a sermon that I'm just so excited about, Reasons versus Purpose 3. 
The question is, is God good? And we're going to see, I really believe, a tremendous Bible text to help us understand how that even though the things that happen to us typically go back to a broken world, but the grace of God comes in and meets us in that time. So Reasons versus Purpose 3, that's coming up this weekend, all weekend at New Spring Church. This will be my last time to see you before the weekends. Mary Alice and Stephen will be back tomorrow. May God bless you. Yes, we love you guys. We'll see you soon. God bless.